Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, hi, uh, welcome. I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that Kang is here. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have him. He's a giant in the community. He's done uh, a lot of work for a long time. Um, he, I think, uh, graduated from uh, Cornell. Um, I forget what year. Maybe I shouldn't say the year. But, I mean, he, he graduated from Cornell, and he's uh, uh, been a professor at uh, – he's a professor at uh, University of Michigan, uh, has uh, graduated 61 PhDs. 63. 63 PhDs. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, was Jennifer uh, Rexford your first PhD? No. Oh. Mani Krishna. You Mani, know Mani. Yeah, I know Mani Krishna. Mani Krishna was PhD. Yeah. And Jennifer, uh, he was also Jennifer's advisor, who's here was, as a visiting professor and gave, actually gave a talk. And also, here's another number for you. You know, um, He has published 680 papers. So match that. <laughs> anyway, so of course he's very prolific, and and uh, as, since the time I've known him, I can uh, believe how much energy he has, and how you know even to this day he's right up there with the leading researchers in the cu most cutting edge fields. So it's a real pleasure to have him here, and uh, I am I, uh, looking forward to to hearing from you. Uh, you know what you guys are doing in the cognitive radio area. So Kang. All right, thank you, Victor. Uh, I, I think you have to discount what Victor said at least by 50%. And uh, whatever I have, uh, have, I have accomplished, they are all students' work, not mine. I was just the, the uh, ring leader, nothing else. Anyway, today uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, our recent activities on this cognitive radio. Uh, we've been working on this uh, maybe last five, six years. Uh, and I listed uh, my current graduate students and postdocs, and also the past students and postdocs. Uh, by the way, this uh, green color indicates the current, and the white color indicates uh, the uh, past members of our group. And by the way, I, I'll try to give you uh, uh, more of the uh, overview instead of giving you details of mathematical derivations or anything as such, because you can find the most of them from uh, published papers. Uh, and also, the, I list a lot of things, but I'm not going to be able to cover the whole thing. I'll try to uh, wrap things up within one hour. Probably I will spend the most of the time on the uh, sensing for white spaces as far as the return of a primary users. So we are talking about two different uh, types of sensing and also the uh, elaborate details of these uh, sensing schemes. Uh, overall, goal of this project, uh, we are trying to uh, make things uh, uh, <clears throat> more adaptive by sensing uh, environments, applications, uh, and also even the uh, physical aspects, and then use this uh, sense information to provide uh, better quality of service or more secure services, whatever have you. Uh, we began with uh, initially these uh, wireless LAN sort of adaptive uh, uh, quality of service uh, sort of techniques, but recently I think we are focusing on uh, this uh, current radio technology. Uh, we've been doing many different things, but we began with a sort of a generic architecture for cognitive radio systems. Uh, I think some of you may have seen this uh, in JSEC, I think in 2000, 2007, there was a special issue. Yeah. Uh, so I, I may spend just a, you know, a few minutes on this without giving you details, so you can find more. And, and then the, uh, our talk about the, how the sensor spectrum, uh, both in-band sensing as well as out-of-band out sensing, uh, especially this adaptive sensing, 
uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by adaptive sensing. Uh, and also recently we've been working on this uh, secure cooperative sensing uh, where we are dealing with uh, the faulty or cooperative sensors and transmitters. And <clears throat> also the, uh, we've been working on the uh, uh, adaptation of resource usage or applications based on this sensitive information. Uh, if time allows, I'll give you some uh, sketch of what we've been doing. And also we uh, looked at this, uh, the spatial reuse, not only time and frequency domain, but also space <clears throat> using these uh, multiple input, multiple output, single and multiband sort of the antennas. And I'll try to conclude my talk with uh, proof of a concept implementation and experimentation. I'd, I'd like to <clears throat> emphasize this is a proof of a concept, not nothing real per se. And perhaps you, you have seen this FCC webpage. I, I saw the <laughs> envious office also has the same figure. Uh, so I'm not gonna explain anything. <clears throat> and on the right hand side also this is uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> uh, this chart uh, published by this uh, shared spectrum company uh, as part of an NSF report is uh, widely cited. Uh, essentially what I'm trying to say, uh, there has been explosive increase of wireless applications and user population and also the, uh, there will be a lot of the <clears throat> uh, types of applications are emerging and requiring uh, lots of more resources. And the spectrum is not going to increase uh, in proportion to the increase of these applications and the user population. And that means that we may end up with uh, running out of a spectrum. And uh, how are you gonna cope with this? I, I'd like to make uh, one comment on uh, this chart. Uh, here, I think this is somewhat misleading uh, because uh, almost all the bands are utilized less than 25%. And uh, people may say, uh, well, why bother when this existing spectrum is so terribly underutilized? Why do we worry about uh, sensing and management and all that? Because uh, you will get spectrum whenever you want and whatever you want. This is very much like the uh, internet backbone when you have uh, less than 5% utilization of a link bandwidth or uh, router bandwidth, whatever, why do we have to worry about this uh, QoS, QoS routing? There are tons of papers there. And I remember the uh, one time at Infocom, there was a panel against these uh, quality of service saying that people are working on non-problems, uh, which may be true. And I like to say this wireless case, that isn't the case. Even if it shows less than 25% utilization, first of all, this is a small sample and over a small time period. And uh, within a certain restricted area and over a short time period, some spectrum may be utilized 100% for a short time period. You may not be able to access, or even if you access the internet, it's too slow to be useful. Just like a CPS week this year in San Francisco, in April, uh, there were about 500 people. And I wasn't able to connect to the internet, or even if I, I connect, I couldn't run anything, just time's up. So there will be a, you know, the short-term shortage, whether you like it or not, even if you have very low average utilization. Another important part is the wireless, uh, the applications and users must cope with inherently unreliable and unpredictable sort of a transmission environments. Uh, <clears throat> yes? But zero is still zero, right? Oh, uh, zero is... I'm seeing some bands there that have absolutely nothing. Oh, uh, I think this is like zero... Satellite, for example, is just not being... This, this diagram, by the way, is, is a very sort of a... The <clears throat> The shrunken version, I guess if you expand, they shouldn't be zero. There should be some non-zero small number. Uh, but I guess if it's a very close to zero, I guess that's very close to zero. Yes? I a question about like um, on your analogy of short-term loads and stuff. Like if, if you look at spectrum allocation as a provisioning problem, 
then like economic provisioning would basically mean that you provision for something that is close to the peak usage, such that the average utilization is low, and you stop there. So that would mean that, OK, it's acceptable to have peaks close to 100, because that's basically you know the economic way of provisioning for it. And the average would always be low. And then, but just, just the fact that you're hitting 100% um, some of the time is not does not really mean that there's scarcity. Oh yeah, sure. The uh, the question is a spectrum allocation, and uh, with what time granularity are you going to allocate spectrum, uh, and also the at what level? Okay, that that's the question. If you want to lease a spectrum of this much for your particular sort of a purpose, and you you find the usage level is very low, and can I go back and say I want to lease only? 50% of what I used to lease. Usually, you don't do that. You you do this over a certain time period, so you got stuck. And I, I'm going to mention on, on that aspect later. Actually, this opportunistic usage will facilitate that as well. Anyway, I don't claim anything on this. Uh, you, this is just the, the uh, <coughs> uh, sort of general argument for cognitive radius. Uh, it's not my uh, own charts or anything. In any case, this uh, cognitive radio uh, is. Uh, uh, sort of the presented as a flexible and adaptable means to deal with this problem, uh, in particular with the software defined radios. Although I'd like to sort of the caution you on these SDRs. SDRs are focusing on mostly flexibility and adaptability, not much of performance at this point. Although people are beginning to aware of this, uh, like the USRP, according to our experiments, we can get only about 200 some bytes per second bandwidth because of slow hardware and also slow this network interface, USB. Uh, but USRP2 is much faster, and the solar, the RCB, is much faster. I think this is coming up. But the, uh, for the moment, I think people are focusing on more flexibility than uh, the performance. Anyway, uh, the uh, key issue of this current radio, or radius, uh, is to find sort of the available opportunities uh, in uh, multiple these uh, spectrum bands as quickly and as much as possible. Uh, when I say opportunity, this opportunity could be in time, frequency, or space domain. I think most existing work focused on time and frequency domain, not space domain. Or the space domain is quite interesting. And another one, uh, since I think we are discovering these uh, white spaces or spectrum holes or whatever, and uh, use those holes opportunistically, whenever the legacy users or primary users return, you have to detect their return very quickly and get out of their way. And of course, what do you mean by as fast as possible? Uh, so far, I think the uh, 8022 is the only the, uh, working standard draft. I'm not saying standard yet. Specifies like two seconds. But anyway, uh, these two must be satisfied. Otherwise, uh, this won't work. OK. <clears throat> As I said, I'd like to talk about this uh, generic architecture of the current radio networks, uh, especially the, uh, when we say aware networking. Uh, we are talking about these uh, environmental awareness, especially radio environment. Although most people don't pay attention, but application awareness is uh, very important as well, depending on which application. Actually, I was talking to someone. Uh, he was working on sort of multimedia streaming, so multimedia stre streaming. Um, based on these uh, application requirements, uh, you may want to allocate or manage a spectrum differently. How do you do that? Well, spectrum management typically sits uh, around the Mac or physical layer, whereas applications are way above. And how are you going to convey this? Essentially, you have to use some form of the packet filter-like software cutting through all the different layers and conveying application requirements to a spectrum manager. And also, depending on 
the availability of spectrum condition, applicant may exercise elastic sort of uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, load demand. Uh, therefore, this uh, spectrum condition information must be conveyed to application through this uh, particular interface. Uh, also, the, you have to worry about mobility uh, because depending on mobility, you have a different sort of a data rate, error rate, all other problems you have to consider. Uh, the adaptability, there are many different things you can do, uh, such as you can adjust the sort of the uh, application performance related to parameters, uh, or uh, sort of a, you can adjust the MAC protocol parameters, or uh, space case, the beam forming. Uh, the other one uh, we are very familiar with, uh, the, uh, the channel switching. I think you guys worked on channel switching before, right? Uh, also, the, uh, this uh, channel switching can be used to avoid or mitigate the effects of narrowband jamming as well. If it's a wideband jamming, it's not going to help. But uh, if it's narrowband jamming, you can. And also the security aspect, uh, this is an important one. When you share spectrum, obviously you are opening up your spectrum for others to access. Even if you use encryption decryption, uh, perhaps I think that the, uh, still it is less secure than uh, not sharing your spectrum with others. And also the, uh, all this uh, discovery of a white space uh, and also detection of returnable primary users, all that. If you have a malfunctioning radio device or a compromised device, uh, this may not work. And how do you detect those, uh, the malfunctioning or compromised devices and filter them out when you try to make a decision? Uh, that's also an important problem we've been looking at. Uh, as I said, I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk about this uh, generic architecture. Uh, the, uh, there are four main components. Uh, one is the resource management, the other one is the measurement management, actually sensing management, and the coordination, this is the important part, uh, coordination within a group as well as between groups. Uh, by within a group, I mean when you are opportunistically using particular spectrum band with other the radios, and if you want to move to another spectrum band, uh, you have to uh, make sure all the members move to the same target band at the same time. That's the coordination. And also between groups, uh, if you're not careful, all these uh, secondary user groups may end up with moving to same white space at the same time. Uh, in that case, the target wouldn't be good at all. So how to coordinate these, uh, <coughs> the uh, migration of uh, secondary user groups to uh, white spaces. Obviously, you want to do this without the centralized coordinator. If you have a centralized coordinator, it's an easy problem. And the last, not least, is sort of the policy enforcement entity, which is very important when you deal with the service providers, different countries, or whatever have you. And I don't intend to go over all the details here. But this uh, resource management entity, uh, essentially the <clears throat> what you do is uh, you uh, try to discover the uh, white spaces or uh, the condition of a certain spectrum band, bands or channels. You want to <clears throat> sort of the, uh, come up with uh, uh, sort of the condition map of those bands. And hopefully I think this map uh, will be maintained by individual the uh, cognitive radio devices somewhere. And uh, these maps should be all same amongst the, all the members in the same group. Otherwise, uh, you may draw sort of the wrong conclusion on uh, which spectrum band you want to move to. So usually, I think what we do is uh, we are going to divide up uh, the responsibility for sensing different channels amongst all the members within the group. And then you sort of sense a subset of channels. And then you disseminate these uh, sensitive information to all the members within the group. So <clears throat> sense, disseminate, and then the, uh, all others will listen and update their the spectrum opportunity map. 
And of course, because of the uh, lost messages or whatever, uh, there could be some inconsistency in the map. But nevertheless, I think the, uh, the, this, this is the way we do. And it, uh, it works pretty well, by the way, in general. And of course, you may say, we're going to have a centralized place where we're going to put this uh, spectrum opportunity map. And therefore, we're going to access that. Uh, that has its own problems, too, because uh, what happens if the centralized site, set the, uh, site is not accessible? And I already mentioned that the group coordination uh, between the members within the same group or uh, between different groups. Uh, the typical the state is a scan, listen, and vacate. Vacate means that the, uh, whenever you uh, agree to the discovery of a return of a primary user, uh, then everybody must vacate the channel at the same time. Uh, let me spend <clears throat> more time and give you details on the uh, first part, uh, spectrum discovery using sensing. As I said, I want to focus on two different things. One is out of band sensing, essentially discovery of white spaces uh, outside the channel you are currently occupying. That's out of band, out of band sensing. Theodor sensing is that you want to detect the return of a primary signal on the channel you are currently opportunistically utilizing. Remember that the second part is for protection of a primary user, whereas the first part is to uh, sort of uh, provide a good quality of service amongst the, the opportunistic users. Uh, this uh, spectrum sensing, <clears throat> uh, especially the detection of a primary signal, is done at physical layer using energy detection, feature detection, or matched filter. Even feature detection, there are a zillion different things. Uh, I, I got to point out, by the way, I, I'm not a physical layer guy. But we have to understand physical layer as much as we can, so we can build the max layer or the higher layer. So especially we are focusing on <clears throat> uh, which sort of detection mechanism to use and when, and also how often, and also which sensors must cooperate with each other the selection of the cooperative sensors, and also the uh, when to and the which channel to <clears throat> sense with the what sort of a detection scheme would be all macular decision. So is this a separate video, or is this site looking at different sensing? Oh, the, <clears throat> uh, oh, the, this is, oh, that's the embedded sensor. The other way sensing also the uh, related to uh, so which channels to sense and when? Uh, this is a more generic thing. I don't know. I'm going to talk about the outband sensing first in great detail and the inband sensing later. <clears throat> As you may imagine, though, by the way, uh, we are assuming here the simple case. Uh, each radio has only a one antenna, not multiple antennas. Uh, you can have multiple antennas, but we found that, uh, like a USLP case, you have multiple you know, channels. Interference is a serious issue. In any case, we try to make a problem very simple here, one radio interface. So when you sense other channels outside the current channel, you cannot send or receive data. And therefore, sensing incurs overhead in terms of the uh, network bandwidth and also in terms of energy consumption. And obviously, I think the more frequent you sense, the more opportunities you're going to detect and therefore you may be able to utilize these opportunities for better quality of service amongst the secondary users. But the, uh, that comes at the expense of uh, sort of the uh, <clears throat> data bandwidth or energy that I mentioned. So obviously, you have to make some uh, sort of the uh, optimization. So two things that we should consider for outband sensing case. Uh, one is that you may want to detect as much spectrum opportunities or white spaces as possible. And therefore, you can improve the throughput uh, or, or uh, <clears throat> you can improve the utilization of a spectrum. 
Another one is when you detect sort of a return of a primary user, you want to switch to uh, this white space as quickly as possible instead of taking a long time to find this white space. Since I think the uh, 8.22 case, uh, you have to vacate the channel within two seconds. If you don't find the white space within two seconds, I think your communication will, will be done. You can't communicate anymore. So we have to satisfy these uh, two sort of uh, the uh, uh, requirements. So uh, I, I'm going to spend more time on detail on this. And the in-band sensing case, uh, uh, the, uh, detecting this uh, incumbent return, uh, which of uh, the energy or the feature detection we're going to use. Uh, I'm going to talk about that too. All right, so let, let's look at the uh, uh, maximal discovery of white spaces uh, using proactive sensing. Uh, by proactive sensing, I mean uh, you are trying to sense other channels even if you don't have to move to, or you, you don't have to vacate the current channel. Uh, here I'm, I'm showing <clears throat> simple diagram. Uh, this blue vertical sort of bar indicates periodic sensing. There are three channels. Channel one is sensed more frequently, but each time you spend just a little time. Remember, the longer you observe, the more accurate your detection of white space will be. And also, the more often you sense, the more opportunities you're going to detect. And also, I introduced sort of the logical channel concept here. Uh, this logical channel uh, is a collection of all these opportunities or white spaces. You just put together, and you view this as a one channel, logical channel, that the secondary users can uh, utilize. So see how it goes. Since you are sensing here, this is, a, oh, by the way, I'm assuming very simple model here. The primary user or incumbents, the usage of a channel will be modeled by simple on-off sort of the model. In other words, whenever primary user is on this channel, then it is one occupied. Here, for the moment, I'm assuming that these secondary users and primary users are cannot occupy the same channel at the same time. Although you could, as long as the interference by secondary users is less than this interference of temperature constraint, that's OK. But we are, we are not sort of considering that here. So as you can see, for this part, uh, even if there was a white space, since you didn't sense it just before this, you don't detect this. Whereas you detect all of this, here again, you don't detect this white space. So as you can see, the more often you sense, uh, you will be able to detect all these uh, the white spaces. And the channel two, you have again here. And you are mapping uh, these, uh, the green blocks into the logical channel, like this. So this much of opportunities we discovered uh, that we can potentially utilize And of course, uh, while you are sensing, you won't be able to utilize the white space or anything. And therefore, uh, sort of the, uh, disallowing the uh, reuse of these uh, detected opportunities. Here, what we want is that we want to sort of uh, determine uh, optimal this sensing period. Uh, as I said, the more often you do, uh, you will find more uh, opportunities and therefore utilize more, but that will incur overhead. So we want to <clears throat> sort of the, uh, capture the trade-off between uh, the opportunity discovery and also the uh, overhead associated with the, this uh, sensing. One more thing that I'd like to point out, the, uh, let, let's consider this uh, 802.22, the digital TV case. The television transmitters will continuously transmit uh, from, say, 6 a.m. to midnight. And then from midnight to 6 a.m., no transmission. In other words, the primary user will occupy this channel uh, for a long period and then leave it idle for a long period as well. 
there's no point of sensing so, such, such kind of channel very often. On the other hand, if you deal with uh, a cellular network or some other stuff, uh, this on-off period is pretty random. And uh, depending on how fast uh, these primary uses, uh, the usage of these channels change, you may want to sample more often or more <clears throat> infrequently. So I'm implying that these sampling period itself must be determined adaptively, depending on usage pattern. Yes? You didn't talk about the, <laughs> the interference spaces there. Interference space? Well, you have some of these opportunities are actually extending over into or would have extended over into transmission spaces by whatever the original owner is before the periodic sensing happens. Which one I talked about? Today? So just start with channel one up at the top. The okay. first green bar, where the first green bar you have on the left there are ends where the actual owner transmits, but you wouldn't actually know until your periodic sensing happens. Okay? That's correct. That's correct. So you you are thinking uh, this is also opportunity as well because you don't sense, right? But actually, it's not. Right, it's an, it's an opportunity to interfere. That's right. So, so the, uh, what I'm saying is, this opportunity to interfere. Oops. The, that opportunity to interfere, though, by the way, uh, I'm not dealing with this detection of this uh, change from zero to one is invented sensing. I'm not covering that yet. I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. So what you're saying is, you detect this opportunity, and you, sense, you don't sense until this, right? And therefore, you may view this whole, whole period as a sort of the opportunity. But actually, it's not, right? Because of a return of this primary signal. So you have to have invented sensing detecting the return of this primary signal. And you will find that this is not available. So I'll talk about that, too. So you have a separate method of yeah, Well, the, as I said, I saw. The, I presented the in-band sensing and out-of-band sensing. I'm talking about out-of-band sensing right now. Anyway, uh, we, we did this optimization. And <clears throat> actually, uh, this is in our TMC, I think 2008, May issue. Uh, we sort of derived the sort of analytical maximum uh, of this achievable opportunity ratio, this AOR max. <clears throat> and uh, according to our the, uh, detailed the sort of the uh, evaluation, we can achieve a 98%. And also we detect the up to more than 22% opportunities uh, compared to a non-optimal case. Uh, I'd like to make one comment on, on this, by the way. Here, uh, the uh, we have a, the reference that remember you gotta begin with uh, initial sampling period, sampling interval, and then you perform this optimization uh, based on sort of the uh, additional uh, measurement or sensing results. And uh, this optimization is not sort of a, the convex optimization; it's non-convex optimization, and therefore depending on your initial value. Uh, actually, the solution will be different because you don't have a global optimal solution. That's the one thing. Uh, that's the reason why we have different sort of the initial uh, sampling period or sensing period. And also, the uh, uh, other techniques of if you don't change these, uh, the uh, sensing period, whatever numbers you chose, you're going to stuck with it throughout. That's the reason why I showed that as well. Why increasing the sensing period is going to increase the accuracy? Accuracy of what detecting white space? Yeah. Oh well, the uh, well, if you sense more often, and then the uh, the primary primary uses the occupancy of a channel changes dynamically, right? Because for TVs and microphones, it doesn't make a difference. That's correct. So but you know, the uh, other the uh, like the cellular networks or whatever would be quite different. Though. The TV case is not, as I said, 
Uh, actually, we classify uh, these channels in two different types. One is uh, these are long-lasting, <clears throat> you know, the primary activities as opposed to short-lasting primary activities. Uh, so we, we handle them differently. Uh, th that's, I think, I'll cover in detail in our dice pen paper last year. Okay, so far, the, uh, this uh, uh, proactive sensing, you may say, well, I, I don't want to do proactive sensing uh, because if I don't have to vacate the current channel, it's nothing but waste of uh, the uh, resources because I never move out, right? Or if I move out very seldom, I, I don't gain much. You may do, oh, I'm, I'm going to sense uh, the white spaces only when I have to vacate my existing you know, channel. That's a reactive sensing. Or only argument you can make against this reactive sensing is that since you have a focused idea on availability of other channels, uh, which channel you want to sense first, in the worst case, you may end up with a sense of all the channels and find uh, the white space on the last channel you sense. That means you've got to wait very long, so that, that's no good. And also, they argue with my students, say, uh, I have a better idea than that. What do you mean better idea? Well, uh, we don't have to do these periodic or proactive sensing, but uh, we, we're going to do on-demand or reactive sensing. But we will remember uh, which channel was available, which channels are not available when we did this on-demand sensing. And I'm going to apply this uh, Bayesian estimation technique. I'll begin with a non-informative prior. And then if I do on-demand sensing, and I'm going to collect information on availability or unavailability of a particular channel, then I get one sample, right? And then using this on sample, I'm going to calculate the posterior probability and use that as a prior probability for next stage. If I keep on doing that, Perhaps I think I can have a pretty good idea on the availability or unavailability of these existing channels. So next time when I have to vacate my current channel, I'm going to sense according to the ordered this probability of availability of a channel. And in the end, we, we, we did all this. Uh, we found that that was pretty good, by the way. Pretty good. Uh, in, in any case, uh, let, let me just uh, go over this slide. This is a reactive sensing. Uh, we are assuming here magically we detect sort of a return of a primary signal without any latency. Uh, we are uh, utilizing these uh, channel two, and the primary user came back, and then I have to look for new home, white space. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, I may try to check channel three first. And then we find that channel three is not available, and therefore we try channel one, and then channel one is available, so we move and then utilize channel one, like this. And then <clears throat> uh, again, primary use of channel one returns, so we have to look for, so I sense the channel two first, and then channel three, and then channel three is available, so we, we occupy channel three. So I'll keep on doing that. Essentially, the, uh, look at this, uh, the latency uh, from the detection of a return of a primary user to uh, the uh, discovery of a new home in channel three. This is the latency. And the longer this interval, uh, the worse the, the performance of a secondary user is. And we want to shorten this. Uh, that's the way I think I, I was talking about this uh, <clears throat> Bayesian approach. And we found that <clears throat> the uh, optimal sensing sequence, in other words, uh, there are, say, uh, n different channels other than the channel I'm currently using. And now the primary user returned to this channel. And which channel should I sense first? Uh, I, I want to sort of the, uh, find this channel as quickly as possible. And Obvious intuition says uh, I'm going to calculate sort of the uh, probability of uh, the channels available, and then I'll order this probability, and whichever highest value I'm going to try first. 
But that's, that's the sort of the uh, obvious thing. Uh, when all the channels are homogeneous, meaning that all channels come with the same capacity, uh, that's an easy problem. Turns out to be uh, you sort of all the channels uh, just according to this value. However, if channels are heterogeneous, meaning that channels are coming with different capacity, uh, it's a much harder problem because, by the way, when you're on channel one and you need, say, two megabps, and when you try to move to another channel, you have to find another channel of two megabps. Or, according to what you said, I'm going to have one megabps from channel one and another one megabps from channel six, and I'm going to put this together, I'll achieve two megabps. That's possible, right? That's possible. I think that there, are, there are other arguments why that's possible. In that case, then I got to find the two white spaces or two channels, not one. And if individual channel, channels have a different capacity, obviously that's a much more difficult problem. Yes? In the of channels, like channel one being empty or used has no bearing on what channel two state is? Oh, sure. They're independent. Well, why are they in? What, why are they dependent? They are dependent because uh, actually the FCC forces it to be dependent. If you've got uh, transmission going on in one channel, then the channel adjacent to that is oh, not okay. equal to the other channel. Okay, okay. okay. That, that, so that, there's, that. there's a little bit of that too. Oh, you can handle that too. You know, by separating this, you can handle that too. Now, for the moment, to simplify, let's assume all these are independent. If you want to avoid the, the, uh, these adjacent channels because of interference, uh, you can handle that too by sort of the uh, grouping differently. And we found out this heterogeneous case, heterogeneous case we can come up with a suboptimal sub sequence uh, that sort of satisfies the nested condition of optimality. OK, the, uh, here is a simple sort of a model. Uh, by, by the way, one more thing that I'd like to point out. The, uh, uh, how many channels are there in, in the first place? Let's consider the uh, digital TB. Uh, TB channels covers from 54 megahertz to uh, I think it's 806 megahertz or something. Altogether, there are 68 channels, each of 6 mega, megahertz. So there are quite a few. And if you try to search, say, 67 other channels to find the white space, regardless whether you order it or not, that's going to be very expensive. Yes? I heard in New York there are only two. I heard in New York City there are only two channels available. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. If you look at it, okay. I have that's, that's the problem that we're dealing with. I mean, we have to. I mean, there are rural areas, there are lots of channels available, but in the urban areas, there are very few. And actually, the real problem is that if, if there are not that many, um, people are not going to build uh, hardware and silicon to sell because they need the urban areas more than the rural areas. So it's not, it's not a sort of a technical issue, but it is definitely an issue for us. There are more channels. The, the, the thing, though, by the way, uh, I, I, I feel that the, this TV channel case of 54 mega, megahertz is a VHF, and 806 is a UHF. Uh, by the way, the signal propagation property for these VHF and UHF channels are quite different. Yeah. You know, these are high, the high-frequency channels uh, will interfere less, but signal will propagate much shorter distance. And these uh, low frequency channels, uh, will the signal will propagate much farther. Therefore, the interference uh, range will be much bigger. So <clears throat> that there, there are interesting the aspects, especially the, uh, when you con consider the channel heterogeneity. It's kind of interesting. Uh, in any case, uh, let's assume there are a large number of channels, and you don't want to consider all these other channels uh, to discover this white space. Rather. You want to divide these channels into two different groups. One is a backup channel group, the other one is a candid channel group. This is a part of the 802.22 uh, standard draft, by the way. I didn't create these terms. And uh, somehow you have to come up with, come up with uh, the algorithm to put which channels in the backup channel, and which channel in the candid channels. Uh, by the way, the candid channel case you don't send. You sense only channels in the backup channel. 
And uh, when you choose these backup channels, you got to make sure that you don't have so many channels and therefore sensing overhead will be low, but you will have, must have enough channels to discover enough channels for your need. If you don't have enough, then you have problems. So you got to do some optimization. Okay, let, let's look at this. Uh, actually, I used to have an animation, but somehow animation didn't work, so I eliminated it. Uh, so you have in-band channel sensing. Uh, you are using a particular channel. Say, <clears throat> uh, if it's a TV band, uh, now a primary user came back, and all the TV station is on. Then obviously that channel won't be useful for a long time. What you do is that you, in that case, you will remove that channel into this candle channels because it's not going to be useful. I'm not going to use it. And then I have to find uh, the channel that I can move it to from this backup channel. So upon the vacation of this channel, you have to ask, you have to go to this backup channel states and you pick up uh, sort of the uh, uh, enough channels for you to maintain your <clears throat> sort of a communication. And if uh, you can't find uh, enough channels out of these backup channels to satisfy re your requirement, what can you do? You have to go and recruit some of these candle channels and promote them back to this backup channel. Also, if some of the backup channels you sense and find that they are no good, almost all the time occupied, you demote those channels to the candidate channel. So you, you have to have a transitions uh, like that. And as I said, the, the question is uh, how to form these <clears throat> uh, backup channel list and also how to update these uh, backup channel list. That, that's, that's an interesting question you have to address. Uh, <clears throat> one thing you can do, initial backup channel case, what you do is uh, you can order all these channels based on the probability of becoming either. Uh, how to determine this initial without any observation? Uh, you know, just like the TV band case, we know uh, which channel uh, will be used over what time period. You, you can have some idea, although you can update based on observations or sensing later. So you, you can begin with something. Uh, actually. That alone is an interesting problem. Our dice pen paper covers this in detail. And of course, the, uh, how to update uh, the probability of a channel becoming idle or not. Uh, actually, estimating that probability. I mentioned the Bayesian probability, the estimation. Another one you can use is the maximum likelihood. The uh, maximum likelihood. Uh, <clears throat> That estimation uh, the works well only when you have enough sort of the sense samples. If you don't have enough sense samples, that estimation is not accurate. But Bayesian estimation is more robust even if you don't have enough samples. So as I explained on um, this reactive sensing using this Bayesian estimation, uh, that's a reasonable way to do it. This is, this is with the <clears throat> performance evaluation. The uh, left-hand side the figure uh, dealing with this optimal sensing sequence that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and there are two different types of delays. One is uh, the type one delay. Uh, if you find the, the needed uh, sort of white spaces during the first, first round of a search, uh, that we call type one delay. And the type two delay is the delay associated with uh, the discovery of a white space using more than one, one round of search. Actually, this is the one that requires uh, sort of the backup channel list updates and all that. And of course, you will have a combination of both. Right hand side is dealing with the case with the backup channel list update. And uh, if you combine these backup channel list update, uh, you can 
reduce this uh, uh, delay associated with the discovery of uh, the white space by 91 percent. It's a really pretty good. Yes. What is that tested on? Are those like real characteristics of uh, primary users, or is it just there's no real characteristics? That's the bad aspect because the current radio. Uh, these networks of secondary user or opportunity user, they haven't been deployed yet. So what you do is, I think the uh, um, more or less, I think you, you have to run simulation, or, or you derive sort of the uh, uh, mathematical the formulation and the run the MATLAB-based simulation or NS2-based simulation. It's simulation results. Just trying to understand, there must be some basis as an input because it seems the value of something like this is very much dependent on what the exact characteristics are of, uh, of primary users because as to what makes sense because it's all seemingly data driven, right? So, yeah, well, uh, yeah. I think we, we ran simulation uh, here primarily on uh, digital television. Digital television case, so we have pretty good guess. Because the TV, you know, the broadcasting stations will operate, uh, say, you know, 18 hours a day, six hours off. Uh, some TV stations will, you know, broadcast 24 hours a day, but quite a few don't. In that case, uh, you can have a very simple sort of the uh, uh, on-off model with a certain period. But if you deal with the cellular network stuff, I, I don't have a statistics. Lambia, do you have any statistics? Uh, I, I tried to get. Oh, yeah. They measured it in Germany or something. I don't know. I was trying to get the information from these wireless service providers, and they don't want to provide them. I couldn't get it. I, I tried to persuade the Korean company, SK Telecom, I didn't get it. And I was trying to talk to Sprint, I didn't get it. We should try to measure it using a spectrum analyzer. We can do some measurements. So please do and share with us. <laughs> That'll be good. I want to come back to the dependence point then. Um, it seems like channels are dependent because TV channels, like you say, midnight between six, like the chances are if one is occupied, the other one's occupied too because it's just that time of the day when TV channels transmit. At the same time, the cellular networks as well, I mean, I would guess they are times of the day when there's pressure on, more pressure on the spectrum than other times. So that creates dependence uh, between channel occupancy again. True, true, true. Uh, you know, the, if you have a measurement, probably I think this would be a, not, not really dependence. I think the, uh, you talk about the uh, characterization of uh, the uh, channel utilization by primary users, uh, TV case, TV broadcasting station. Uh, the uh, cellular case, uh, obviously during the daytime, you know, you, you have more occupancy than nighttime. Although I think because of the time difference, I don't know. And also the, uh, you have uh, uh, more sort of uh, the, the occupancy during the daytime, I'm sorry, the, during the weekdays as opposed to weekends, although uh, people will use their cell phone during the weekends because of uh, this uh, price structuring. So uh, you, you may be able to derive this usage behavior as a sort of a periodic function on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or whatever, except uh, you know national holidays or whatever. Uh, but uh, we, we haven't really done anything on the characterization of this uh, workload or usage pattern, which is very important though. We should have. We should have. Otherwise, actually, uh, I was uh, insisting on that if we don't have it, at least we should have some benchmark, just like a spec benchmark for CPU design. We all know that spec benchmark is not realistic. It's a terrible benchmark, in my opinion. But since everybody is using the same benchmark, so the results you can compare the apples against the apples. But I don't claim anything about the uh, representativeness of uh, the uh, traffic we used for evaluation.
this invented sense, I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish up the, uh, I, I have a lot more, but I'll, I'll try to finish up here. The invented sense, this is uh, the last the Morbid Camp paper. Uh, in other words, you want to detect sort of the <coughs> uh, returning incumbents. Uh, could it be digital TV or uh, you know, small scale, the uh, wireless microphones? And these uh, 11, uh, 1122 uh, standard specifies the detectability requirements, like incumbent detection time uh, should be uh, you know, less than or equal to two seconds. And also the uh, listed detection or false alarm probability should be less than 10%. Uh, why they said two seconds and less than 10% of a missed detection and a false alarm? I don't know. I'm pretty sure they have uh, sort of a rationale behind these. And also, as I said, we want to sort of enhance the quality of service for opportunistic users. Uh, to do that, we, we got to minimize the sensing overhead. Uh, so essentially, I think we propose a two-tiered sort of a, the uh, sensing, cooperative sensing. Uh, especially, we wanted to have uh, sort of the uh, maximal cluster size measured in terms of radius, not number of sensors. Also, you got to pick the sensors uh, in such a way that these sensors will contribute sort of different pieces of information in discovering this, uh, the uh, primary user. You don't want to recruit the sensors which will provide the same information, redundant information. And the, also the, uh, <coughs> the uh, these I think we, we consider a bit higher density sort of the <coughs> uh, uh, current radius. Uh, what we worked on here, the how to determine this uh, sensing period and uh, how long you want to spend time on sensing. Uh, for example, energy detection case, uh, uh, you spend typically uh, one millisecond, but the uh, feature de detection case, depending on what kind of feature you are detecting, in the order of uh, 10 milliseconds or more. So the question is, uh, do you want to use this uh, expensive uh, feature detection every time, or you want to use this inexpensive energy detection multiple times? That's the question. And turns out to be that depends on depends on uh, <clears throat> sort of the uh, noise signal level. If there's a no noise, uh, then this uh, energy detection is uh, pretty good. But if noise power is uh, higher than certain level, this energy detection is totally useless. So we want to answer questions. Uh, when energy detection is better than feature detection, or when we have to use a feature detection. Uh, that's what we worked on. And we consider these, uh, uh, the IEEE 802.22 uh, standard thing, the uh, you know, 155 kilometers keep out radius, and also the <clears throat> uh, typical base station with the radius ranging 33 to 100 kilometers, or the 33 kilometers typical. I thought also we, we address all these uh, signal to noise war, all that, but you know, anyway, the results are here. Uh, if uh, noise uncertainty is uh, zero, then the uh, energy detection uh, is pretty good here. Uh, but if you increase noise uncertainty, uh, the energy detection gets deteriorated. For example, <clears throat> if you have the average received signal strength uh, the greater than uh, minus 115 dBm, then I think you should use a feature detection. Uh, you can show all of this. Also, we uh, derived the uh, two important parameters. One is uh, average received signal strength <coughs> threshold above which the, the energy detection is better, and also the uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, average received the signal strength above which energy detection is feasible. Those are two parameters that we, we derived. Actually, we are currently working on the several different things. One is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the security aspects, uh, malfunction, malfunctioning sensors, uh, compromised sensors. And also, the uh, most existing work assumes a sort of stationary transmitters and the stationary sensors. Uh, these assumptions may not work uh, when you deal with the small scale, the wireless microphone for the transmitter. And the current radios, usually they move, and therefore uh, somewhat unrealistic. So we are considering mobile uh, transmitters and receivers. Uh, we, we have a small result at this is uh, the Coral Net workshop. And I think we have some, yeah, we have the security related stuff at this is CCON. Uh, assuming these uh, radios and transmitters are not moving. Essentially what you're doing is that you are uh, using this uh, spatial temporal correlation. Because transmitter doesn't move, receiver doesn't move, and then you are supposed to generate sort of the uh, reference or receive the signal strength. And if there is a significant deviation, uh, you will say, ah, this guy is malfunctioning. And you eliminate from sort of the decision making process. That's the idea. It's no brainer. It's a very simple thing. Uh, actually, I have a lot, but I'm, I'm going to skip all this. And I'll finish off. Oh, the test better stuff, maybe I, I should have mentioned that a little bit. Uh, uh, Caltech, we, we have the uh, mesh network test bed built with uh, the, uh, uh, the socket, <coughs> the router, and also the uh, wavelength card, uh, and also the, the Atlas chipset based network interface card, uh, deployed in our department building. Uh, we have a 17 node version. And I think we had a pretty good time uh, measuring the link asymmetry, all that. That's our the Mobicom 2006 paper. And also the uh, <coughs> this uh, Linux based uh, sort of the open software we did. The current here, we are building <coughs> the uh, new test bed. Actually, three different things. One is uh, using the robot. Actually, we are moving access point a little bit. This, this is very similar to the uh, DARPA, this uh, Landroid. Uh, the access points are moving uh, in such a way that uh, you can maintain connectivity or uh, enhance the, sort of the uh, signal to noise ratio. And the question is, you know, which direction you want to move, how much you want to move, and then you take measurements uh, to decide whether you made the right movement or not. Uh, that's very similar to sort of the uh, mobile robot sort of a path planning or whatever. It's an interesting problem. And uh, the, uh, another one that we have been playing with is USRP. USRP uh, one was pretty bad. And the USRP2, we bought three. And we're in the process of building a much larger test bed. Perhaps we can have about 40 some. And I need about a quarter of a million or $300,000 for that. So I'm in the process of writing the equipment grant proposal to DOD. Uh, I hope I'll get it. And also we want to consider the, uh, that MSR Asia is so the RCB-like sort of hardware. If it has Linux device driver, <laughs> Victor, you may remember, it has nothing to do with uh, disliking liking of Windows. But uh, now most of the experiments are done on Linux, so we want to have that. See how it goes. And the, these are the sample publications I have. And you can find the most of the things on the website uh, right here. I'm going to stop here. So, yeah, sorry, I think it's the I, No, I'm, there's, uh, I mean, it's obviously we've done a lot of work. 
Uh, is there any questions? Are there any questions? As usual, I missed the deadline by uh, what, 13 minutes. Well, you started, you started late as well. So, oh, is that right? Okay. Uh, um, all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.